Welcome to the Nature Journal Club. Today we're going to be drawing songbirds. Um, if you've, has anybody taken a songbird drawing class with me before? Okay, so only one person will be really confused by this because if you either have one of my books on uh, where I'm saying here's my approach for drawing birds um, or if you've taken a bird drawing class with me before, it's going to be confusing because I'm going to be telling you a different thing. Um, on my most recent, uh, on the, the, the Africa Nature Journaling Workshop uh, trip that we just took, my approach to drawing birds changed between the start and the end of the trip. And I think I've got an approach to getting the, the oomph, the basics of the bird, down on paper with, with fewer lines that helps me look at the most critical things just a little bit earlier. And I found it was really, really helpful. So. Um, even though I had scheduled this workshop before I left, I had to come back and change a bunch of the things and how I was presenting things because um, I think you'll like this approach better. And if you aren't confused by the step way which we did it before, um, well then, um, all the better. So here is, uh, I, I wanted uh, at the start just thank uh, Vivek Kanzodi for um, the pictures and the slideshow. So all the slides of birds that you're going to see in this are from his website, which is birdpixel.com. Actually, this one I cheated on. I, he has three pictures of the same bird. I just put them on the same branch with Photoshop. But um, it's going to be, um, uh, he's, he's, uh, he lets uh, sketchers like us use his, his photo resources um, for our, our art. So it's a great place to learn from. And actually, part of your homework is going to be involved it's going to involve drawing from some photographs, and so this is birdpixel.com. That's a, going to be a, a useful resource um, to go if you want to see, spend a little bit more quality time with any of these pictures that you see. So here's the here's the spoiler alert. Um, the way that I used to draw birds is I would start with the general posture of the bird, and then I would block in the mass of its body, and I would block in the mass of its head, and so that I would not, uh, you, this kind of can give you a bird that looks a, kind of like a, a snowman. Um, then I would block, in, I would look for negative shapes and angles um, around the edges of that and go from there. So it started with the posture, then body, then head, and then I would look at those negative shapes and angles. Um, the more I'm looking at it, the more I'm finding that these negative shapes, the angles around the edge of the body, are so helpful and so important to drawing it um, that well sometimes when I would kind of get part way through a drawing I my at this point well, no my birds moved and I really can't see what that angle was that was back there um, so the new approach which I'm going to be kind of developing more is actually starting with the negative shape on the back of the bird so starting that because that notice that this also gives me the general posture of the bird. So that posture line, I'm already getting, if I'm getting that negative shape, but if I'm starting with that negative shape, I'm getting the bonus of, of, of having that. Then, from that hanging, the body below that. So um, this, this new approach is going to be starting with that negative shape, and then developing that picture out from below. So that's... Um, <laughs> the Reader's Digest condensed version of this workshop. Um, however, I don't want to just work on drawing a bird from the side. I find that um, if I teach a class and it's all about here's drawing the profile of a bird, and I've done some workshops where we really kind of go into that, then when people get out into the field, they're waiting for birds that are from the side. And if you're waiting for birds that are from the side, for some reason they will all be sitting there turned towards you. And so then what people will do is try to sneak around to the side of them or try to imagine, like, how would you look if I turned you from the side? Or flip open a field gun, kind of like, oh, that's how it looks from the side. Copy that. So what we're going to do in this workshop is we're going to start with the side view of the bird. Then I'm going to go for a front view. And we'll look at sort of the details of how that bird is put together at different postures and angles from the front. And then we'll turn the bird around, look at it from the back, do the same thing. There's a few other kind of details and strategies to quickly block in the view from the back. And then, we're going to look at the three-quarter view angle. So a three-quarter view angle is where you see a little bit of the side and a little bit of the chest, so that the center line of that bird is not going right down the middle of the body. 
Um, you can either have a front three-quarter view or a rear three-quarter view. And we'll take a look at both of those. There's a few kind of interesting counter-intuitive details of how those birds, the angles on those birds um, in those positions work. With this, you're going to be able to draw a bird from any angle. So um, that's where we're going to be going. We want to be able to turn this bird around three-dimensionally in our heads and on our piece of paper. And we're also going to explore a few strategies just for quickly getting this out on paper, emphasizing those negative shapes. Um, so here again with Photoshop, same bird two times. But the reason I put this in is I wanted you to notice that the same bird can easily sit at a different angle. Just by pivoting at its hips up in here, it can lean forward or sit very vertically. Um, I saw one tutorial on drawing birds that said, you know, make an oval at a 45 degree angle because this is the way the birds sit. This is true um, for all the birds that sit at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> Right? Um, however, for all the rest of them, um, you know, it turns out you can draw those too. Um, so the, the trick is different birds often will have a different characteristic lean. So a shrike will often be down a little bit lower. A kestrel at a steeper angle. A scrub jay often sits very vertically. So you're just going to look at whatever bird you're looking at and you're getting what's going to be typical for well, for that species and that species doing whatever behavior it's doing. So there's going to be a bird in front of you. And you're going to look for that general posture of your bird. The, um, so there isn't just one way to do it. You can have that initial posture of the critter at just about any angle. Um, I'm going to see if I can. Ah, oh, so here we go. So my bird sketch here, each one of these is a reasonable posture for the same species. So the bird can sit upright, it can also lean, it can also come down. But you're going to want to look at whatever the posture of the bird that you're observing is and go with that. I think that the, probably the biggest posture, bird posture mistake that we make when we are sketching, let's see if I can, for some reason, this is hard for me to grab the dot. Ah, no, I won't do that. So what happens when you drop your laptop? You can't grab the dot. Ah, here we go. So I'm going to speed this up. So three reasonable birds, you can have well, the same species can be in all sorts of different postures, but there will be something that's fairly typical. I think that the most common posture mistake is what I call the hot dog bird. Um, and this comes that if you sort of start with a general posture, let's say you've got a bird leaning at an angle like this, if you put a big oval and a head all along the same line, you get something that kind of looks like a You've taken a hot dog and a marshmallow and stuck them on a stick, or perhaps a cattail, um, but that's not a typical bird posture. Um, scientists, when we study birds and stuff them for having them fit neatly in drawers, we do stuff them this way, they call them study skins, but this, um, this, this, this very um, erect head leaning out in front of the body posture is not a typical thing. A bird can do that, um, but usually what you're going to see is if, if you have the body of the bird in here, imagine that there's a, a wall in front of the bird's chest. The head of the bird is usually going to sit back behind that wall. Um, that way its head is resting on top of its body. It's not having to use muscles to have its neck all the way out here. It's got that head back over its chest. When it's actively feeding and doing things, you can take its head and stick it out here, but then often when it comes back to rest and is hanging out, you'll see that head sitting down, the weight of it, sitting down onto the body of the bird. So that puts the general posture 
something more like this, rather than this lean forward. Had fixed. I will not rely on trying to grab the dot in my box. So here's just sort of a fast forward with that little bird. You can see when you see the head sort of sitting up on top of the body, it kind of looks like, oh yeah, that's that's what I see. So my friend the Clark's Nutcracker here is just, uh, we're going to look at several photographs of Clark's Nutcrackers. I want you to notice two things. One, the general posture or body angle is going to be different on each of these birds. And also, generally, you're going to see the head behind the level of the chest. Like that. So here's a bird at a steeper angle. And again, that head's behind the chest. Give your bird a little bit more of a tilt, same thing, more of a tilt, same thing. So yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a typical posture. It's capable of taking its head and sticking it out here. It can do that, as you see here. Right? But this is a bird being much more, more active. And in this pose, in this position, they're probably not going to be hanging out and posing for you to draw them very long. So very often I find myself drawn to the birds that are kind of like, I'm going to be still, at least for a little while. And uh, this bird is not doing that. On smaller birds, um, because the head weighs less, it's a little bit less of a barrier. So sometimes they will have their head out more. But you will see, even with little warblers and things, very often at rest that head is sitting right up there on top of their body. So that's the idea of posture, and kind of avoiding the hot dog bird, stacking the head. The next a big thing to look at is what's called the proportions of the bird. And this is, how big is your head relative to your body? And so I'm going to draw two circles here. And my question for you is, uh, I'm going to put a big head on one and a smaller head on the other. Which one of these are, uh, would be okay proportions for drawing a bird. Hmm? Yeah. I think either. That's right, it was a trick question. <laughs> so she says, so it, it just depends on whether you're drawing a big head bird or a small head bird, right? So that either are, are possible. Some birds have heads proportionately bigger than others. Um, so there is no formula, you know, you take the head size, you double it, that's the body size. It's going to be different for different birds. The general rule of thumb is that the smaller the bird, the bigger its head. Um, so little birds like chickadees have big old heads. So um, just sort of speeding up our little chickadee here. Right? There's a little chickadee with a big head. And next to it, that smaller head, that might be the general proportions maybe for a robin. Any bird can also fluff out its feathers or fluff out part of its feathers as a display. So you want to take a look at um, when you're, you're, you're checking out your bird, what I'm often doing is just sort of thinking to myself, all right, so your body is this size. I draw, once I block in its body, I then will put in a head, and I'll double check. I'll say, did I make my head too big? Some people tend to make their heads too big. Some people tend to make them too small. I find most people probably make them a little bit too big. So I'll double check by saying, did I make my head too big again? And I'll go, oh, yes, I did. And then I'll shrink my head down a little bit. 
and then I'm going to be able to kind of block in my little bird shape with a head that is going to be the right size for my bird. But double checking that before you drop in any details on your bird is really, really helpful. So here's a little chickadee. Notice that it looks cute. Right? Cuteness is a, just a physically, physiological response to proportions. So if something looks cute to you, what you're doing is that's your body responding to proportions. If something has a big head or a big eye, we go, oh, oh, it's a neonatal feature. We want to take care of it. And so <clears throat> if your bird looks too cute, you made the head too big. If it's not cute enough, you need a bigger head. Um, some species, uh, so, but it's not an absolute rule all, uh, that, that, that big heads on small birds. There are just some groups of birds that have really big blocky heads. Shrikes have really big heads. Um, kingfishers have really big heads. So here's a kingfisher and they've got these big blocky heads. They're doing all sorts of stuff from excavating burrows to catching their prey with these huge um, beaks and heads. So they're just big blocky headed birds. So you're going to want to look at that. A good way of kind of getting your brain to be able to see proportions is to find a species of bird that is common around where you live and just drawing a lot of that critter. So if golden crown sparrows are abundant near your house, if uh, juncos, there's a bunch of them around your house, draw a bunch of juncos. If it's brewer's blackbirds, draw a bunch of brewer's blackbirds. And what's going to happen? After you've made 15 or so pictures of brewer's blackbirds, you're going to have an intuitive feeling for what the proportions of a brewer's blackbird should look like. And then when you look at a bird, and it's got a head that is proportionately bigger than a brewer's blackbird, it's really going to stand out to you. You'll look at that and be like, wow, that's a really big-headed bird. Because your brain has kind of got a clear idea of what's normal from something that you've really looked at well. So your brain will be going, this is bigger than a brewery blackbird head. And so by getting yourself comfortable with just one species, you give your brain kind of a, a point to measure from to notice changes in proportions for other birds. Let's take a look at a side view of uh, a bird here. Um, when you go to sketch, here's my old approach um, for drawing birds. I would start with the posture. I would then block in the body. I would block in the head, double check the size of my head, give myself a little eye beak line and a tail. And then again, I would start looking for those angles. I would start looking at the negative shapes and angles around the bird, very often where the head attaches to the body and where the tail attaches to the body, especially on the underside of the tail, you get really neat angles in. Um, and this has worked pretty well for me for a while. Um, but I noticed a couple of problems with it. Um, so one problem is, I'm going to see if I can speed this little wren up a bit. Speed drawing the wren. So one problem with this approach is that if I was starting with this very bold line, that would often kind of lure me into sticking the head on the end of the, the stick and making a hot dog bird. So um, a lot of people they would go like, they'd start with that and then, okay, and there's my bird starting off. The other is, very often my bird would move by the time I'm trying to notice this negative shape up here behind the head. And I find that this negative shape up here, by, by the back of the head, is really, really helpful for getting the posture, the position, the, the sort of action of whatever bird that I'm talking about. Also notice that this angle of the back is also along the general posture of the bird. So if I can get that angle, I don't need to make a separate line there. So my new approach is to start by looking at this negative shape. 
start with this, draw that in, and then I'm going to hang the head and the body off that line. So with this one line, I'm getting, not, I'm getting two critical things, the posture and I'm getting the angle of that um, head body. I can then block in these little pieces next to it. And with fewer fuss at the start, okay, not fewer fuss, with less fuss at the start, um, I'm getting the critical angles on this bird. So this is helping me kind of key into, I'm going to look, ch -ch -ch. it's going to give me the posture. It's also going to give me the head, the relative head body position. Gets me looking at negative shapes early in the drawing, which is going to really help me be able to draw what I see. So some birds hold their heads up like this. Some birds you're going to see the head, when you look at that, that initial posture, it's a straight line all the way across the back. So that's a bird that would then be holding its head in here. So um, when you're using this approach to blocking in the bird, there is a mistake, there is a place that this can go wrong. So I taught this to somebody and they started doing it and I watched that there's this, there's this one mistake that kind of easily kind of crept into what they're doing, so I'm going to show you what it is. So the first two examples of here are don't do this. So the problem is if I said this is a bird with sort of a flat back and then I draw its head all the way out here, all of a sudden I've got a hot dog bird. Dun, dun, dun. Right? The same thing could happen if I put in that sort of bird with a sort of kink in its neck, sort of an angle behind the head. So I start drawing one of those. Now if I put this bird's body hanging down straight from here, and then its head out there, same thing, hot dog bird. <gasps> right? So what can you do about this? Well, I'm glad you asked. So for this position here, where it's flat back, um, see how far forward that head is? I don't want that. In this position, if this is my body of my bird, my head is going to actually be sort of sunk down into that other body ball. All right? That gives me this bird that has sort of a flat chest along here, rather than this being at an angle. Right? So rather than it's being sloped up. Right? So that head, sink it back this way so it's still resting on top of the body. Similarly, over here, if I've got a bird that's popped its head up, what I'm going to do is not have the body ball be back here, but forward enough so that I can rest my head on it. Right? So notice that from this corner here, I drop a line down. Right? That's sort of where I'm kind of getting the front of my ball. From this here, I actually have a lot of ball that is in front of that little corner there. So I'm not doing that. Right? This is going to force me to hop down bird. Let's look at a real bird here. Start by, first just notice this sort of weird phenomenon. Look at the contour of this bird's neck while looking at the bird. Now, don't look at the bird. Instead, look at the shape of the air behind the bird. And notice when you look at the shape of the air behind the bird, it's easier for your brain to see this contour. The, there's no distracting detail here. When you start looking at the bird, your brain gets all confused and distracted by the detail. But if you're just trying to trace that line, your brain is going to be a lot better off looking at the negative shape. So on your piece of paper, what I want you to do is, well actually first, close one eye and air draw. Air draw this angle here and back. You don't have to worry about sort of the tail coming up. So we kind of have this coming down and back. And then on your paper, block in a chest overhanging that. Put in a head. And 
This bird's beak is pretty low here. I made mine with too much of the forehead. But now look at this as a negative shape. Look at the shape of the gray air right over here, and we're going to carve that into our bird. So it's interesting, uh, for all my talk about looking at proportions, I didn't stop and look at my proportions. <laughs> Let's just pause for a moment here and take a look at the proportions of the bird that I drew versus the bird in the photograph. What's different? Head's too big. Head is too big. I did not do this on purpose to make a teaching point. But since it's here, I'm going to take advantage of it. I just drew a bird with the head too big because I didn't stop and check my proportions. So it's really, really easy to do that. That's why I want to keep reminding myself. I just want to get in there. It's like fun to draw beaks and things, right? I tend to draw my heads too big. So I've got to keep reminding myself, stop, check your proportions. The point to place to do that would be just when I had, the best place to, to check those proportions would be when I had my this and I had this. At this point, it's really easy to go, whoa, that head's too big. Just kind of go back here. That way I don't have to redraw this and redraw this and redraw this. I have to redraw fewer things. If I catch that proportion goof a little bit earlier. Let's take a look at a bird with where the, the back angle is perfectly flat. Here's this big ball of the body, here's this big ball of the head. Notice that they're overlapping. For this, what's really going to help is if your first line, if it's too horizontal or too steep, it, the bird's not going to stack up right. So look at what this angle is. Actually close one eye and air draw it for a moment, and then put that line in at that angle. Now let's try to block in a body ball. Block in a head ball. I'm going to stop and check my proportions. Head too big? Yep, head too big. Okay, no problem. I can handle that. Do you have a good way for sizing proportion? Um, the, what, what I will tend to do is just kind of using kind of a cuteness um, register. Some people will say that, like, you know, measure like one head length, how many head lengths. I think that's more useful on a photograph. It's hard to do in the field. In the field, um, even you know, holding up a pencil and saying, bird, don't move your head. I want to see how many heads down. Um, for me in the field, it's more of kind of a seat of the pants gestalt thing. Like, uh, is that too big? And knowing, expecting myself to see something too big, I often can catch it a little bit better. So once you've got those uh, lines in, a couple other lines that are useful. One is the eye beak line. So the eye lines up right with the beak. I will put in a line where the tail comes in. And notice that the tail is not coming in straight off the back here. Right? My back is coming down a little bit in here to where my tail is inserting in my body. This is often a really cool negative shape here, where you get the edge of the breast feathers meeting the undertail coverts. Undertail coverts being a cone of feathers right down here. Another very useful first line is what is it doing with its wing position? This bird has its wings tucked up above its back. So I will start from a point somewhere up in here. Exactly where you start this, you actually have a little bit of flexibility for two reasons. One is that the point of this ring up, wing up here, that is where the bird has its wrist on its folded wing 
folded up like this. So the bird could have put that here, it could have had it here, it could, we could actually move that point around a little bit so you've got some flexibility with where you start. And very often the tip of that gets covered up by a little curl of feathers. Here are a little bit of breast feathers that overlap. So somewhere in here I start, but I'm going to notice, okay, that's going to go to right over my tail. And I draw in that bottom edge of the wing. That's a very useful first line. Some birds will droop their wing below their tail. So with that, you're getting a lot of sort of, that's a very expressive, useful first line. Next month, we're going to be doing a deep dive into some bird anatomy. We're going to be looking at details of wings so that you can really quickly simplify them to get them onto paper. We're going to do the same thing with beaks, feet, eyes. So we're going to take some kind of trouble spots that people have in their bird drawings and we're going to really work those, understand the structure there so that you can, with a few lines, go bump, bump, bump and kind of represent what you're seeing more quickly. For now, I just want to give you a really quick and dirty shorthand way of handling a wing. Right? Um, in the wing, we're going to be thinking of this wing as having um, functionally sort of three different parts. The first is, there is a pad of feathers called secondaries that sit in a big pile on the top of the wing. Tucked underneath those is a wedge of longer feathers called primary feathers. So these are secondaries and these are primary feathers. On the front edge of the wing, there is an arc of smaller feathers called covert feathers that cover up the top edge of the wing. So these are coverts. So a very simple way of handling a wing is this. Just I'm going to put in this step here where you get those secondaries come in. The, the length of how long the prime the secondaries are versus the primaries, that's going to be different on different birds. Some sparrows are like this. Hummingbirds and swallows are like this. So a really useful kind of quick and dirty wing. We'll give you some more wingy tri tricks next week. All right? Take a look at this wing. Do you see that little step? Here, this wing is doing this. Notice that this one is drooped below the tail. The other one was up in line with the tail. Okay. Let's try this. Take a look at the shape of the negative shape here. Don't worry about, oh, this is have a little bump here and then a little bump here and then it straightens out. Um, what I want you to think about is just this big angle change there. On your piece of paper, draw that in, and then put in a ball for your body, a ball for your head. And it turns out if you're tracing on the board, it's easier to get the proportions right. <laughs> no wonder. Yeah. Give that a try. Once you get that, you can put in a line for the tail, a line for the beak, a line for the foot if you want to. I also find this negative shape here, coming down off the beak, under the head there, that's really useful. This negative shape there, also really useful. Great places to look for negative shapes. If you're making all your drawings this big, you're making your life much more difficult. You're thinking, I'm saving paper. I'm being a good ecologist. Um, just recycle a little bit more. And give yourself 
a little bit more room on your piece of paper to kind of spread out, kind of mess around, be able to see what you're doing, have room to correct mistakes and things, uh, and you're going to find that it's a lot easier for you. Give yourself a little bit more room to play around. On this wing, pretty long primaries. There's a little step right there. In subsequent classes, we're going to go into more details of sort of filling in parts of this bird. But if you can start to block these things out with a few lines, you are way ahead of the curve. What I want to do now is to go from the side and take a look at the front view of the bird. But before I do, are there any side view questions? All right. You guys ready for front? All right. Let's look at bird tummies. Um, well, here's just one more, a couple more sides. Well, this is kind of interesting. Just in terms of head proportions, just compare these two. It's subtle. When you look at how big the body is, how big that head is, that's a pretty large-headed bird. Kind of a big blocky head. Quick little review again of how I Lock that guy in. I start lightly, loosely, essentially making a ghost drawing. And then, if I like those proportions, I can start on top of that. There's that simplified wing shape. This is um, the front view because there's no wing you really have to do. It's going to be easier. Um, and so what we're actually going to do is we're going to look at three different front views. Um, get. So what I'm going to do is take a look. Remember we had those birds and they could rock their body angle? Right? So think about, if you're looking at this bird from the front, how much belly versus head would you see? A lot of belly less head. On the first one, a lot of belly. Next one, less belly. Third one, even less belly. So you see how the amount of belly that we get, if you're looking at it from the front, it's less and less and less and less. So by the time you're over here, a lot of this is the bird is turned away from you, and I can't see that. So I'm going to draw three, these birds, how this bird would look if it's pointing towards you, this one and this one. So on this one here, I've got an oval, a big vertical oval for this big vertical belly. My major parts are then a head, I have a belly, I have under tail coverts, and I have my tail sticking down. I hope that that can be. Can that be seen in the back? Yeah. Okay. On this one over here, 
I've got a head and some belly. Notice that the approximate size of the heads here is the same. I've got the same amount of head. So because as this thing, the body's looking, tilting towards you, that head is staying in front. All right? So that's not changing. What's changing is how much bird tummy I'm getting to see. And something in between those two is, well, something in between those two. Foreshortening is a really difficult thing to get your brain to do. So the idea of foreshortening is that if you're looking at something like a form and a hand here, if it's tilted towards you, this axis that's tilted towards you just got shorter. Just look at the, the, the length of the shadow of my hand, right? As that tilts towards you, that whole business gets shorter. That's hard to draw because our brain knows that that form really isn't shrinking and we want to draw the way that it really is. So on the, this view, this is kind of the easy one, right? The eyes and the beak are in the same row here. Um, for the quick and dirty beak from the front, you can just make a little box, or a little box with a slightly more pointed top. I've got a little bit of bird throat here. Not much in the way of wings showing from the front. And in the bottom of the bird here, there's, there's a big pad of feathers on this side and a big pad of feathers that overlap slightly in the middle. And that makes a little line up the lower belly of the bird. Essentially, the bird has a bald spot in its middle here and it does a comb over. <laughs> the upper chest of the bird has feathers all the way across, a little more smaller, kind of more compact feathers. So I have this part kind of coming down, here's my zone of smaller feathers, my upper breast. And then I have these zone, two zones of flank feathers on the bottom. If I have a notch in the tail, it's going to be symmetrical. My legs come out at a slight angle. They often will come out, not straight down, but often at a slight angle like that. And that's going to end up being, ending up being surprisingly important when we start rotating this bird. So for my medium one, I could just copy and paste this whole head over, because that head is staying the same size. But the belly here and the tail are getting tilted away from us. So essentially I've got the same head copied over, then less breast and belly. Notice the head sizes are the same. Well, this ends up being a little bit smaller. That's because I just wasn't being very careful. That would be the same head size there. And I'm also going to see still a lot of the legs. Because if, it's, if the legs are, if it's holding its legs here, it's tilting its upper body. The legs, if the legs crouch, then their length will, their apparent length will get shorter. But if it's just tilting its upper body right, from its hips, you're still going to see a lot of legs. And in that third one, my tail is completely hidden from view. This one, it's actually looking down a little bit. If I put the eyes and the beak all on the same line, it's looking straight at you. If I have my eyes on one line and I put my beak, maybe a little pointed, a little bit lower than that, then you get the feeling that you're looking at the top of the head of the bird. It's starting to look down. The one here with, it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to see those, those big feet out in front. If it crouches, it bends its ankle, right, and crouches those legs, then this part will shorten. But just it tilting its body doesn't do that.
The reason that foreshortening is difficult is a really interesting and useful phenomenon called object constancy. And what, what object constancy is, when you see me do this, you're not over there sit, sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, his forearm just got shorter, <laughs> right? That's so weird. Your brain knows it's the same length forearm just tilted towards you. Right? Or if you see um, a, a, a leopard walking from shade and out into sunlight, you're not thinking, wow, its coat just turned bright. That's weird. It's like it's shape-shifting or a frisbee is coming towards you in the air. You're not going like, it's an ellipse. No, it's a circle. No, it's an ellipse. No. Your, your brain is just thinking, oh, here's the same object and it's floating through space. And your brain is still tracking that as this round thing, even though you're seeing it as, from different angles. This is useful when you want to reach up and catch that frisbee that's coming towards you. However, what happens when we want to draw is our brains don't want to draw a tail of a bird that we know is long. We don't want to draw it short. Because of object constancy, your brain is going, no, look, I, it may, we may be seeing it from that angle, but I know that that is actually this long tail. I'm not going to give you permission to draw it that short, even though that's what you're seeing. So you have to, when you're drawing anything that's foreshortened, tilted towards you, you're going to have to overcome your propensity for object constancy. And just realize that that's going to take mental gymnastics. We're going to see the same thing when we look at the back of the bird, and it's tilting towards us. When you look at the back of the bird, those wings are getting shorter, shorter, shorter. If you know what length those wings should be, drawing them as this really short, compact thing, it's hard to get to force your brain to do that. It will, your brain is going, no, wait, 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 it looks wrong to me. So you just have to expect that, that there's part of your brain that is going to want to draw it so that it looks right, i.e. not foreshortened, right? So knowing that foreshortening, your brain is going to rebel against you, gives you a chance to actually draw things foreshortened when you need to. So let's take a look at some bird bellies. Notice how much bird belly there is here, right? Bird belly, bird tail, right? You tilt this bird towards you a little bit, there is less belly, less tail. I tilt it toward me even more, even less belly, even less tail, right? And I still have a lot of leg showing. So that's just taking that upper part of the bird and tilting it from the pivot of those legs. And then all these things that you know should be there, like, can I draw a sparrow without a tail? You, your brain says, I know there's a tail there. Well, it's, I can't really see it from this angle. Give yourself permission to draw what you see from that vantage point. It actually can be really, really challenging, really difficult. Keeping track of the center line of the belly is very useful in drawing things from the front. If they have a pattern like a black bib, like a junco, it will come down to this line and be symmetrical on either side of that. If there are dots, or lines of things on your bird, those are going to be symmetrical on either side of that line. Roughly symmetrical. You can't just take Photoshop and copy this. Thing. Generally from the front, you're going to have three toes forward, one toe back, unless the bird has had an injury. So there is this poor little guy. The back is going to be the same thing. This whole idea of foreshortening is really going to be in your face. Right? It's challenging to get yourself to, to, to draw a wing that you know should be this long as this short little compact thing. So here's what we're going to get. There's a zone of feathers on the upper back. This is called the back. The scapular feathers are in there too. For, we'll kind of get into that next, uh, next month. But right now we're going to call this the back. And the wings are going to drop down on either side of that. Remember how we had those long primaries and that box of the secondaries? When you look at both wings together, it's going to make this letter H across the back. So 
So here is the big H. All right, coming down with the primaries, up with the secondaries. There, so there's my H. I'll erase this so you can see my little H. I want to get my wingtips to be the same length. I want to get the ends of the secondaries to be the same length. And I also I want to be parallel with the tip of the tail, this point here. So very often I will put in what I call parallel guides. These are lines that I draw in like this. That's just going to help me get the length of the primary on this side to be the same length as the primary on this other side. We're going to start emotionally preparing ourselves for the foreshortened view. It's going to be weird, right? Um, but what I'm going to be doing is just taking these zones and shrinking them not on this axis, but on this axis. So I've got less head. Notice that this line at the base of the head here went like this. This one is coming straight across. My wings are coming down, but not as far. And the amount of space between that where that sort of horizontal bar is on the H, that is going to be less. So shorter primaries, shorter secondaries. On this one, my wings touched in the middle. In this one here, I'm actually giving my wings some space in the middle. The wings can droop around either side. But it is hard to get yourself to be able to make a wing that you know is this side to actually get over there and do it that size. So the little h, big h, little h. <clears throat> and that is made even more extreme when I get to this view over here. So if this one had its head was doing this, the base of the neck was doing this, on this one here, it's going to be doing this. Just turning that back up towards me. There's a little bit of back feathers, and the entire wing is going to fit in this space here. Here it fit in this space here, and here it fit in that space there. So that entire wing, so look at this really little H. Hard to get myself to do that. And then down below that, my tail. The tail can drop down or flip up independent of the rest of the body. So you can have the body at one angle and the tail at another. Um, in this case, my legs hanging down. Notice that this is a rather confusing tail angle. The tail, I have the tail coming to exactly this point here, right? Where the belly feathers are coming around. This is what we call in art a line adjacency. Align adjacencies are confusing points in drawings because the person who's looking at this says, well, is this a shape over here? Are there these two little things that are like that? And then they're in front of something else that's way shaped here? Or is that some big object like this, in this case, the tail that's hanging down in front of these? Your brain gets really, really confused by line adjacencies. So um, what I will often do when I see a line adjacency pop up in one of my drawings, I will go, you know, rut row, that's going to, I know that's going to be a confusing thing. If I just flip this tail up a little bit so it's a little bit shorter, so that would be it raising its tail towards you, or l lengthen that tail down so that it is clearly longer than or clearly shorter than that butt belly, that is going to make the drawing easier to read. And so in this case, what I'm going to do to solve that 
is I'm going to shorten that tail. So I'm going to take that tail, I'm not making it shorter this way, I'm, I'm going to be foreshortening it more towards you so that it's going to point more towards the viewer. So here is my tail, pointing it more towards you. It's now just a little box in here. Extremely hyper foreshortened tail. Here are my undertail coverts hanging down below that. And there is my little bird back view, one, two, three. Thinking about these sorts of things ahead of time before you're out there in the field with the bird in front of you is really helpful. Um, a lot of these things like this foreshortening, it's, it's counterintuitive, your brain doesn't want to do it. But if you know that's where you're going to be going, you've got a fighting chance when you're out there with the bird. Does anybody have any back view questions or front view questions? So in the last one, the wings are touching again? So, uh, yeah, so the way, in this one I've got my wings coming up and touching in there again. Right? The same bird could also have them more drooped out on the sides. Yes? How do we make it so that the tail stands out from the rest of the upper body? Great question. So when, you know, if I draw that really lightly, then it feels like it's receding. Sometimes just a stronger line in there pops that part towards you. Generally, light lines on a subject recede, and heavier lines pop towards you. So what people will sometimes do is they'll look around and they'll say, All right, on my drawing, what are some parts of it that are closer to me? Like, okay, for instance, this, the, these parts here, those are going to be things that are on the edge that's closer toward me. They would slightly reinforce those lines. Um, or in this case, it might be some of these lines kind of coming in here and maybe on the tail there. And then that pulls those towards the viewer. A little bit of a stronger line. Thank you. I, I use that trick a lot. Botanists do this all the time, or, or, or botanical illustrators. If they have two stems that are crossing, they'll just take that right where they cross, they'll strengthen the line on the one that's in front, and it bing, just helps that get a little bit more of a sense of depth. So you'll see that right where those things cross, um, that sort of detailing. So let's take a look at a foreshortened wing. Something about this just looks wrong, doesn't it? So if, if when you look at something that's foreshortened, our brains go like, no, 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 you can't be doing that. That looks like a little baby's tail, right? Um, I know the sparrow should have a tail like that. It can't be like this. But when you're seeing them from this foreshortened angle, this is actually what you're seeing. Here's my H. Really clear H on this one. short tail. Our brain doesn't want to let us do that. So we've taken a look at the bird from the side, the bird from the front, and the bird from the back. And to some degree, a three-quarter view is just, you know, you're going to take these ideas from the front and from the side and put those together on the same picture. But there are, there are a few really counterintuitive differences about how those birds in that three-quarter view look that really will help your drawing feel like this bird is in this three-quarter view. And the three-quarter views are at first a little bit more intimidating, um, but what I'm going to encourage you to do is to don't let it psych you out to mess with it and see what happens. So everybody's going to get some homework. So here's your homework. 
I need everybody to give me seven drawings. Seven drawings of birds. You're going to go on um, birdpixel.com and find seven drawings that are interesting to you, where the bird is in, a, in an interesting angle. Right? And um, play with the sorts of ideas which we're looking at in this class. One great way of doing that is to print out a copy of that photo and then just trace right on top of it. You draw right on top of it. Like, here's my center line. Here's how I'm going to line up these wingtips. Like, I can see kind of the geometry of this. And then on the piece of paper next to it, I'm going to make a more freehand drawing of that same geometry. So you're mostly just, it's a study of the geometry of the bird. Right? And how these different sections fit together. Rather than getting lost in, I want to make wingtip texture. Right? But you're going to sort of block these birds out. So do several of these drawings from different angles, and angles that are interesting to you. And I want to encourage you to don't be psyched out by three-quarter view. Um, we're about to show you some tricks with that. Um, mess with it. And for your last one, what I want to encourage you to do is to make up a bird at an interesting angle from your head. Right? And um, so you're not directly copying one photograph. You can look at several different pieces of reference, but put together your own bird showing the geometries of this thing. How would this look from, uh, how would I put this together? Um, this is great if you're sitting in a meeting. Right? Just have a little piece of paper by you, and you're going to now invent a rear three-quarter view bird. Let some generic bird. It doesn't even have to be a real kind of bird. You're going to make up just sort of your generic bird, and you're going to play with these things. The reason we want to get these templates into our head of how these birds look from different angles is you're going to be out there in the field. There's going to be a bird in a front three-quarter view picture position. You'll start your sketch of it, and then the bird's going to move. And if you've got that template in your head, you can actually finish that drawing from you know, looking at more details of, OK, I see where the belly goes. It's now in a different position, but where would that go? I know where that's going to go. All right? um, or maybe the bird is really cooperative, and it sticks there and, and keeps sort of showing you its backside. But um, if you haven't messed around with bird backsides, you're going to be waiting for this bird to turn its front to you. All right? And every view of a bird you get becomes a good view of a bird. Like, oh, good. I have a, here's a really great back view. A lot of people are out there. They're waiting for the birds just to get into a side view so they can sketch it. I can't draw that one, can't draw that one. Oh, good. There's a side view one. Oh, no, now it moved. What do I do? All right, so this gives you a lot more flexibility. So you're ready for the three-quarter view tricks? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, don't let it psych you out. Don't think like, oh no, all these sort of things. I'm going to show you a few kind of landmarks that really are going to turn this bird for you. Right? And you can do this. The critical thing is just put in some reps with birds at these different angles. And this, these templates will become just sort of ingrained in your head of like, oh yeah, okay, three-quarter view. Yeah, I, I know that. That's that, that center view. I, 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 can, I can handle this. You can handle this. You can do this. So here we go. Do do do. All right, so three-quarter view. Um, what we want to start doing is start thinking about the general posture of this bird. If from the side it's at an angle like this, right, so if from the side it's at an angle like this, and from the front it's at an angle like that, then from a three-quarter view, it's going to be something in between those two. Right? So it's going to, the general posture will be steeper than what you see if you're looking at, from, at this bird from the side. So you can expect a steeper posture, but not as steep, uh, but not perfectly vertical like you see from the front. And now, it's going to start to look a lot like you're drawing a bird from the side, but just with an initial sort of steeper back. So I'm going to look at that negative shape along its back. So here's its head angle vertical. Here's its back angle. 
I'm then going to drop in the belly ball and that head ball. Stop and check your proportions. Yes, I need to do it too, right? I'm going to stop and check my proportions. Did I make my head too big? Did I make my head too small? You don't have to worry about that when you're making up a bird. Um, now here's, here's the big part, the center line, down the middle of the face and curving around the belly, just a little bit in from where the side of the bird is, right? So just in from that, this is my bird center line. Whoop. 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 This landmark is going to be so helpful in drawing this bird. Um, another useful thing that I'm going to be doing here, oh, no, no, let me, I'll come back to the other useful thing. I'm now starting to place details on the head. If this was my center line, I am also going to have my eye line cut across that. This is going to help me place my beak. My beak is going to start from a box right in the middle of that T. So that's where my beak comes from. It's not going to be out on the side of the head. It's going to be from a spot in the middle of the head here. If I have a long beak from the side, from the front, and it's a little box, that means from a three-quarter view, that beak is not going to be as long. So I don't want, so it's, it's, it's hard if you've got you know, something with a really cool long beak. You want to, in the three-quarter view, put that same length on there, but you can't. Just force yourself to make it shorter than you know that beak is because it's at this, this three-quarter view angle. The feathers on the far side of the head are also really important. Well, actually, first, I'm going to uh, enlarge this part in here so everybody can see what's going on. If this is my bird head, and this was the box of the beak, the eye is in here, I will often put a little line, just like this, right on top of the center line above the beak, very often there's a pad of feathers here and there's a pad of feathers here above the beak. And where those come together, they make a little bit of a seam that you see right above the beak. That's going to help me keep track of the center line of the middle of my head. And I also want the feathers on the far side not coming down to the bottom of the beak here. But they want to come on... So they're wrapping around the head. So there's bird head on the other side of my beak. I don't want this. If my beak is coming from here, I want that far side of the head to be doing that. In placing the wing, it's going to start much closer to the back. So you don't have to draw as much wing. So the wing here is starting way up this way. There's very little back showing, very little wing showing. I'm going to follow that center line up to show a little bit of that crease in the middle of the belly. Here's that pad on the front, on the, on the, the, the breast, that zone of smaller feathers that goes across the breast up here. Notice the angles on this pad. This is really important, that it doesn't do this. It doesn't curve here to that line and then curve away with this going the same direction. So I'm not, I don't have some curve like this that I just don't see part of. This far side of the chest is pointing away from me, so it's going to hook up more steeply there. Different angle here, a little hook up on this side. If the bird has a notch in its tail, our brains know that from the front, that notch is going to be in the middle. But if I'm looking at this from a three-quarter view, one side of that is actually going to be foreshortened towards me. So there's going to be a short side and a long side of that little tail. So 
So it's not going to be, your brain wants to, in a tail that is coming down like this, you want to make that notch symmetrical. That would be what you'd see if you see it from the bottom. Again, this would be what I would see from that three-quarter view. Hooking this up, this center line, this short side, this long side, this little piece here, all those help you get to a sense of the three dimensions of this. The same is true for the leg positions. Look at this. If you have legs that are coming out symmetrically from the front, and I rotate this bird like this, this arm is now pointing straight towards you, this one you're seeing at an angle. So I don't know if this is, is, uh, is this in the screen of the video? All right, so from the front, I'll kind of right here. So from the front, these are my two legs, right? These, they, they're the same length, right? Your arms seem to be on. Okay, I'll stand on chair. All right, so for friends at home. Whoa. All right, here we go. All right, those are my birdie legs, right? So they are out at a slight angle. Notice that they're symmetrical. When it turns towards you, this is vertical. This one is at a different angle. My legs, all right, haven't changed their position, but because I've rotated, I see this leg straight, this one at an angle. Right? Amazing. Isn't that cool? So this really helps turn your bird. That really helps turn the bird. All right? So I'm highlighting a few parts of this that really kind of help you visualize this. This starting closer to the back. The little bit of line on the top of the beak having the far side of the head wrap around that beak so that the beak is coming out. If this thing has a nice hood, like a Junko, that hood is going to hook up more steeply on the far side rather than going out at the same angle. So I was trying to turn this into a Junko, but uh, inaccurately do dark on the underside of the Junko, but Junkos are actually light on the underside of the tail. Um, here's some wing and back. Gotta fix our Junko tail though. Anytime now. There we go. Um, so all those things help you turn that bird. So that's your toolkit for the three quarter view. The most critical, essential thing I would say for this is to keep track of that center line. That's really a big deal. If there are stripes on the breast, those stripes are going to be symmetrical on either side of the chest, but you're just not able to see the other side very well. So this side will have stripes coming down, and then on the other side, you're going to be thinking, like, what would be the equivalent of that coming down there? So I'm just kind of trying to get a little bit of the next one. So I forgot, on the lower chest here, on these, these bushy flanks, these often have more shaggy feathers. Their stripes are, are more broad. So what I might be able to see is a little bit of this one over there. All right, so if I've got this one here, I've got this one just starting to kind of and wrap around that other side. That helps also turn that chest. So birdie from the front. Notice this nice crease up the center. Birds will often say, look, here's my center line. It's like a jacket with a zipper on it, right? This is where they put on their bird suit and clipped it together. And so there's this right up there. It's like, where is the center line of your chest? Oh, thank you, right? Take a look at the leg angles. See those leg angles? 
This one, straighter. This one, longer and at more of an angle. Another really nice point in this is take a look up right here. This side of the head wraps around down this way, and here's the bill that comes in like that. See how that bill, and if you look very carefully, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there's actually a little white line going right up the middle of there. Right? That wraps this, that, all that does, even if you've got a bird where you've drawn it entirely in profile, if you just turn the head slightly, it's going to be like, If there's a pattern on the chest, here's that hook up the other side. So don't just take this and kind of bring it out like that, same, same. It's going to hook up more steeply because you are wrapping around the side of the chest. The more that it rocks towards you, the more that is, here's a nice little hook. Look at these leg positions too. You see that same thing. Here's the straighter one. Here's the one that's at more of an angle. So that bird's just doing this. We've turned slightly this direction. You're seeing this one is straighter. This one at more of an angle. Actually, before we go on to... Actually, let's do back, and then we'll handle three-quarter view back and um, the back, three, uh, three quarter view front and back at the same time with, with questions. The three quarter view back is going to start exactly the same way. Here's that negative shape. Here's the ball of my body. Here's my mass of my head and I'm checking my proportions. Now, if we were drawing this bird from the front, I would draw in right here my center line, right? That would be the bird looking towards me. But I'm not. This is going to be the back view. So go away. And my back line is going to be close to the back. So the front line, the front center line is going to be close to the front. The back center line is going to be close to this back edge. And you remember how the beak fit into the head? You had part of the head wrapping around the other side of the beak on that other three-quarter view. It's going to be the opposite here. You don't see where the beak attaches. It's just going to go into the side of the head. And for my eye, all I'm going to put in is a little vertical slit, but closer to the beak than I think it should be. Because all that part of the head is turning away from me. So this eye close here, vertical. If you, you, your, eye, your brain wants to draw a little round eye. But you do that, and it's going to take that head and turn it back towards you. So my eye is a little vertical slit. Off my center line here, I am putting these different zones of my head. This is what's called the nape. The back of the neck here, this is the nape. And then I'm going to have my back feathers. Notice what happens when the back feathers come over here and they reach this center line. Watch what I do here. I'm going to draw a little line across, drawing a line across that center line, Whoop. and then it's doing the same thing here. On the far side, it's hooking up more steeply, broader circle here. So off the center line, steep hook up here on the back, more gradual turn up there. And then the wings hang down from that. The wing on the far side um, takes on some really interesting shapes. Sometimes the feathers all will line up in them, and you don't really see that, you know, oh, I've got primaries, secondaries very um, uh, nearly as clearly. The wing on the side that's closest to you, you are going to see those um, details more. Do you remember the parallel guides that I used? They're going to be huge here. They're going to be incredibly useful. So I want my two wingtips to be the same length. I want all the parts of the back of my bird to line up with each other. 
So if this is where my secondaries end, this is where my primaries end, this is the base of my upper tail coverts, this is the base of my tail, this is, you know, parallel with this should be um, the base of you know, all of these other parts of my bird. So I've got these parallel guides. Same thing here, asymmetrical tail tip. Highlight some of the parts here. The hook, steep hook here on this side. Just a little bit of sticking out. Keeping track of the center line is going to be really, really important. The wing is going to be start closer to the front of the bird. Remember, on the breast one, it was closer to the back. So sometimes you're going to have very, a very small crescent of chest. And the legs are going to do the reverse of what they did in that three-quarter front view, where the close one to you was straight. As it turns around more, you now see the close one at more of an angle and the leg that's on the far side of the bird as straight. So I will often just draw a little ball in where my feet go to uh, initially help me place my feet. If you're drawing um, feet from the back, it's a little bit easier. There's just one claw that goes over the back. That claw um, goes, has one bone in it, and then it's sort of a little sack of baggy skin with a claw attached to that. So um, it does not wrap around the branch. That's a bird with a broken toe, <laughs> right? It's straight and can have sort of a baggy bit at the end. And you don't, it's easier to draw these because most of the toes are pointing the other direction. So this leg angle is another thing that's going to help us get this sense of the bird at an angle. And I also do want to stress the value of these parallel guides. That is a handful of back view tricks. But with this, you've got, you're sort of going to know what to expect as you're looking at something and trying to make sense of it uh, from the back, either from your memory or while well, looking at a photograph or a real bird that's in front of you. Does anybody have um, any questions? About, actually, well, one other thing bears. Uh, repeating here, is that people will also have a tendency in this view to make the beak too long. If you're drawing something like a robin with a long beak, they'll put that full length out there. But part of that beak is already hidden by the head, and it's pointing away from you. So a robin could just have a tiny little thing sticking out there. Maybe even no eye you know, visible at all, depending on how far uh, the head is turned from it. Are there any three-quarter view, front or back, questions? The thing I'd like to reinforce is that notice it's the same basic bag of tricks, of things. What you're what is making the back turn towards you is really very similar to the things that are making the front turn towards you. We had wing position front to back. We had the hook on the front to back. We had either not seeing where the beak attaches or seeing where the beak attaches. Right? Um, that leg position, that tail angle, all of those 
are going to be useful things for you to be able to get your bird to look 3D or to, to be at a better angle. bird from the back. At this point, I want to just point out a couple of things. That is roughly parallel with that. Is roughly parallel with that. Okay. So we've got these little um, those, those, those parallel guides still really help you be able to um, to, to, to handle. Think of where the back center line is on this critter. And also notice that if it has its back to you at a three-quarter view angle, its head does not have to be in the same position. So the head rotates independently of everything else. Um, so you can have a back three-quarter view with a side view of the head. Look at what's going on with this far side wing. Right? Um, I was having a lot of trouble, difficulty with far side wings, so I just spent about an hour going through a bunch of pictures of birds and looking for birds at three quarter view angles, and I just did a whole bunch of studies of not the entire bird, I just did maybe 30 sketches of far side wings. And by the time I was done with that, they were much less intimidating. So what you've got here is this is your secondaries here, and this is your primaries. They're all lined up with each other. So it's not doing some kind of yeah, this thing. Um, but um, I don't have to be intimidated by that. Right? I've got, you know, this is just a bunch of feathers and other ones kind of coming up more tightly here. Once I sort of see like, oh, far wing can do that, then that is going to make far side of the bird drawing a lot easier. Notice here, I see a lot of the H. Over here, it's more foreshortened. So spending, if you are going to look at a bunch of pictures, maybe spending some time just getting yourself to zoom in on what happens on that far side wing will make, it's, it's a little trouble point, right? But it, it, it doesn't have to be. And these views can be, it can be a really extreme thing, like look at how far this bird's, how much breast of the bird you see on this one, you're seeing that much of the bird's breast. Whoa. All right, so mostly back, 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 back. This bird has this bright yellow chest. Would you be willing to not show it in a picture? What if you gave yourself permission to do that? So this is an extreme rotation. This one, less so. But notice on this guy, so here you have, this is a back view here, right? And on the head, this head is rocked slightly towards you. So this is a slight back view with a slight front view. It's because those bird heads can do anything they want. <laughs> oh, here's this also kind of note this little kind of that little notch right there. That's the thing I was talking about. That little seam right there above the beak, I find is really 
useful because it helps me as I'm drawing keep track of where my center line is and also my viewer who's looking at my picture, I want them to sort of continue to see this. This is going up as the middle of my head. You're seeing, you know, that center line. It helps them get oriented up there. Otherwise, this could just be a big blank zone of real estate and sort of this gives you, you know, I often will look for just a little landmark to orient myself and my viewer in a space like that. And this little thing does that really net well. Center line. It's a bag of tricks. We have our bird from the side, we have it from the front, we have it from the back, and front and back three-quarter views. In each one of those, there are different sorts of things that you can include in your picture to help both you, the artist, stay oriented as to the geometry of this bird. That helps you draw it and the person who's looking at it, be able to look at that bird and see it as this, this three-dimensional thing. Your homework again, seven drawings, find photographs of interesting angles, and don't think of it as making a portrait of the bird, think of them as studies to help you play with the geometry of this bird. Right? What are their major masses, and how, what happens as that thing is turning in space? So you're not just, oh, I want to copy this picture, but if you're thinking, oh, that's very little chest, this thing must be rocked towards me, then your brain is kind of engaging in the most useful way as you're making these. So don't just kind of blindly kind of go through and copy some pictures. Really get in there and think about what is going on with this thing in three dimensions to give you the angles and stuff that you see. You play with that, then when you are out in the field, it's going to be so much easier to be able to get these things down on paper. And if they move, you can still follow that same drawing. Have fun with it, and I'll see you in the field. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you like Edgewood? I do like Edgewood. Um,